Y si podemos todos, por favor, poner en silencio el micrófono. Gracias. Todos los seres humanos dependemos de oportunidades. Toda revolución tecnológica genera una revolución social. ¿no? El poder de la tecnología podría ser mucho más importante si tan solo tuviésemos la capacidad de crear más puentes entre quienes tienen el acceso a la tecnología y quienes ya están viviendo los problemas. Cuanto más oportunidades tenga una persona sorda en el mundo real en el que se va a desenvolver, esto se abre una ventana de oportunidades maravillosa. Buenas tardes, buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Es un placer enorme estar aquí con ustedes virtualmente para conocer de cerca una historia de un proyecto de la inclusión de niños y niñas con discapacidad en Ecuador. Antes de comenzar, quería avisarles que tenemos y contamos con traducción simultánea en español e inglés. Si se fijan en el panel de control de abajo a la derecha, hay un icono de un pequeño mundo y ahí pueden escoger el lenguaje en el cual quisieran asistir al evento. También tenemos interpretación Boys. simultánea. Eh, We also have simultaneous interpretation in sign language from Ecuador as well as international sign language. Virtually and to have the opportunity to together learn about and talk about a project that uh, promoted the inclusion of children with disabilities in Ecuador. We have uh, simultaneous interpretation. If you look at your control panel on the bottom right, you'll see an icon of a little world. If you click on that, you can decide in which language you're going to be watching this event. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, and, uh, disculpen, iba, iba a hablar en español. Eh, es un placer enorme eh, It's estar acá. a great pleasure to be here to launch an unbelievable documentary that was directed and produced by Pablo de la Chica. But before we launch this documentary, we're going to have a conversation with a number of experts from different disciplines in order for us to start thinking collectively about the complexity of the issue of inclusion. It's an enormous challenge. It's in a challenge that we need to face in order for us to be able to have a region and countries and societies that are more equitable and likewise more prosperous. So without further ado, I'd like to now yield the floor to Jessica Bedoya, Chief of Staff and Executive Advisor to the Office of the President of the IDB to share some insights and some opening remarks to get us started with our event. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, you have the floor. Thank you to all of you. I'm extremely, I can't even say the word, I'm very proud to be here. But I can start my remarks. 
Good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be here with all of you to launch the speech list is not equal to dreamless documentary. The inclusion of disabled persons through technology innovation is an important subject to be able to begin to create real change in the region. All people deserve a right to reach their maximum potential and to be able to ex access all the social and various services in their country. In practice, this is not easy, especially for disabled persons. 15% of the world population has some sort of disability. In Latin America and the Caribbean region, we have 85 million people with some form of disability. Disabled persons are one of the most marginalized groups in our society with less possibilities of garnering employment. And they also have a higher risk of suffering from violence, especially women. We need to address these issues related to dis disabled persons, and we need to be able to ensure their proper inclusion in the region's economic development. As part of the portfolio of projects at the IDB, we want to ensure that people are treated in an equitable and fair way. We need to provide new ways of providing services and opportunities to promote the political participation and eliminate the educational barriers. And this needs to be done through work with the community and through various services. We need to build bridges, but that's not enough. We need to involve the beneficiaries in all of these processes involving innovation because they have a unique knowledge of what reality they live and they know better than anyone what they need to create real social impact. And that's what we're talking about today. Since 2009, the IDB Innovation and Technology Division has been working with Ecuador through the uh, Japan Fund and working with the capital city in Guayaquil in Ecuador and has been working with disabled uh, persons so that they can achieve their dreams. The documentary today just shows us one portion of that work, especially as it relates to the community of deaf persons. We talk about uh, the story of four deaf persons. Damaris, 16 years old, Micaela, 16 years old, and Juan Carlos, 23 years old. And with this, when this product, project began, as, when he was a student, and now he's a professor of the same school. And we need to understand the reality of deaf persons so that we can create better, more inclusive societies. Technology and technology cannot automatically resolve complex issues. They need direction for us to be able to be successful. And that's what we're trying to do here. We see Victor showing how happy he is when surrounded by his peers. And we want to be able to replicate this all over the world. And in the case of Micaela, who dreams of uh, higher education and who has aptitude for mathematics, and Juan Carlos, who has an attitude that is so, so optimistic, he thinks that everything is possible. This project requires the intervention by parents, communities, teachers, and students to be able to address the issues of disabled persons. We need to capitalize on this unbelievable potential that we have. They've all been connected to technology in certain ways. And in many places in the world that were also marginalized, we've seen how technology has led to some improvements. And thanks to Japan's generosity, we've been able to develop these technology and innovation projects. And the project has been designed, implemented, and verified and has been established in different locations. The, some external data indicate that these students have been able to improve their performance in the classroom. We also know that by achieving inclusion for children and young people with some level of disability is a complex proposition and it requires a long-term commitment. The coronavirus has affected the entire world, but especially young disabled persons. So this means that we need to face these challenges to improve their access to health services, the educational system, economic and financial support, and to try to deal with the issues of violence that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. We also need public policies in the short, medium, and long term to support these programs. The IDB vision after the pandemic includes inclusion and diversity, which are key elements as well as the role of technology and innovation. The bank will redouble their efforts in these arenas because failure is no longer an option. Thank you very much for joining us today. 
and I'd like to invite you to engage in this discussion with all of us in addressing this important agenda to address the issues that impact disabled persons in our region. And I want to ensure that the history of Micaela, Damaris, and Juan Carlos is heard the world over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica, for your kind remarks and your support. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Shigeo Shimizu, Executive Director of Korea, Croatia, the UK, Slovenia, Japan, and Portugal to share some insights with us. Mr. Shimizu, welcome. You have the floor. Buenas tardes, uh, Jessica, uh, Pablo, Good afternoon y a todos to Jessica presentes. and Pablo and es all un, the folks who are joining us here today. Uh, para mí it's a real pleasure for me to join you today. Japón y el, uh, BID son grandes Japan socios and para ayudar the IDB a, have been great partners in helping Hace más the people de 30 of Latin America. Años. For Japón over 30 los years, Japones en el Japan has y created two funds de in collaboration with the IDB, and they have contributed more than $400 million in donations de, eh, to various nations. Japón ha ayudado, and through these funds, Japan uh, has provided países, support to no all 26 countries in the region. Uh, countries in the region, por ejemplo, and we delved into different uh, sectors, which include infrastructure, naturales, uh, medio ambiente, respond, response uh, to natural disasters, uh, climate change, and uh, as you can see, con son we also work okay. with disabled persons. Ahora it's bien, a key focus como nos for us. Indico, Jessica, uh, as Jessica el día de hoy, uh, seremos, uh, testigos today del, we uh, will witness the de, launch of the world premiere of the documentary el, uh, Speechless is not equal to Greenland. This is a product, a production of Pablo de la Chica, el cual by Pablo de la Chica, who undertook this project in Ecuador. And who had some support from our fund. And through this project, we have supported these mechanisms that seek to train and educate disabled children and adolescents by using technology and innovation. And the results of the project have demonstrated that the performance of the students increased significantly as a result of the program. We're very excited to learn a little bit more about the stories of these four beneficiaries through this wonderful documentary. Over the last 10 years, we have financed more than $6 billion grants in this sector. Uh, and we are happy to continue to support de la region, disabled este people de, uh, in the region because los, uh, this is Japón. one of the most important subject areas for Japan. Lastly, we want to thank all of those este who have been involved in this proyecto. important project. Uh, parte, Japón continuará la colaboración. Uh, on our behalf, uh, Japan, uh, or Japan uh, will continue to support the IDB in these efforts that are undertaken in Muchas the Latin gracias. American and Caribbean region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shimizu, for your kind words. And I want to thank you for all of the wonderful support that Japan has provided to the region, and in particular for your support for this wonderful project. Now I want to invite Carlos Walpatin, leader of the Competitiveness Technology and Innovation Division, and who is the author of this project since it began in 2019, and Pablo de la Chica, the well-known director and producer of this wonderful documentary, so that they can have a discussion and we can listen. Hola, Pablo, ¿cómo estás? <laughs> Hello, Pablo, how are you? How is everybody? Greetings to all of the people who are joining us from all over the world. Well, first and foremost, thank you for joining us for this event. It's very important for us. I did have a couple of questions for you. I know this isn't the first time that you have produced a documentary about uh, children and adolescents that face a great deal of strife. You've done documentaries on um, children who live in war-torn areas and others. 
So in your work, you always try to create an environment that contrasts with the reality that is being experienced on the ground. In this case, this is a very complex and difficult uh, reality, and it mixes in some moments of happiness and joy too. So as a filmmaker, when we try to face some of these challenges that society poses, what's your approach? Well, I think that in the rather convulsive moments that the world is experiencing at the present time and that is being experienced in different parts of the world, we have two main tasks. And those of us who work in these fields, in these areas, including photojournalism and photographers that work in war zones, first and foremost, have to inform the public at large. And we also need to look at the more focused effort to look at the various stigmas that exist in the world. It's important for us to see the history from a different perspective. We're currently living in a time that is by and large considered to be very dark. And these four young people in Ecuador, nevertheless, demonstrate that they have a light within them. And so the stories are focused on some of the really more beautiful aspects of life. And so it will invite spectators to see that they are undoubtedly involved in a struggle, but they're facing this struggle in a very interesting way. And those of us that work in this sort of production consider this type of story to be vital. So when you're talking about these children, we're not talking about a context that is as crude as some other topics that you have addressed in other parts of the world. Uh, children, soldiers in Africa and what have you. But how do you come up with this contrast? I mean, many times, uh, whoever watches any of your documentaries has to be faced with this rather crude reality. And throughout the course of your career, contrary to just pursuing the almighty dollar, you try to try, you try to pose the situation, the question in terms of this doesn't really fit with what we believe. And so how do you come up with these locations of these storylines that you choose to document? Well, I think that whenever I come home, I try to take a hot shower and I stay under that hot stream of water for a good long while and think about how fortunate I am. I'm a person that has to be thankful for the family that I have, for the friends that I have, for the good fortune that I've had. I have a place to sleep. I have a roof over my head. I have food. And in many ways, I feel like a millionaire. I feel like a rich man because I can dedicate my life to the service of my audiences the service of people that I document in my films as a movie director, but I also do what I do because I want to be able to sleep at night. And this may be a rather banal remark, but I've worked in many areas and the idea that I can sleep well, that I can eat, that I can have a roof over my head makes me a person of privilege. And so I feel happy, I feel good when I come back home. And this sensation is one of the biggest drivers for me whenever I go back out into the field. And I haven't done so in a while because of the pandemic, but it also drives me to get involved in telling these real stories of real people that, that I think is very important. I was watching this documentary in several moments really impacted me. For example, when Damaris's mother realizes that her daughter is deaf, and she says that when she found out what was most painful to her was that she wasn't going to be able to hear her daughter's voice, and her daughter wasn't going to be able to hear her voice. And there's a statement that she makes that I think resonates with everyone because it's very, very metaphorical. Now we all know about loss, we know about irreparable loss, but at what point, not necessarily in the documentary, 
that as part of your work with the children in Fe y Alegría, did you feel that kind of uh, impact? Well, I've had many instances of those of those types because the work of, of the team that was involved with the Fe, Fe y Alegría project, including Fer, who was my film crew chief and the other team members, really did see many things at the Fe y Alegría school, many different contrasts. In my case, I asked the priest for permission to take a photograph. I remember that among the youngest children, a four-year-old girl could not stop crying because that was the first time that she'd been incorporated into a classroom. And so the teacher was trying to talk to her and keep her from crying. And there was an older man outside of the classroom that I thought was her grandfather, but in fact was her father. And she had discovered, or rather he had discovered that he was suffering from a cancerous tumor and he, he was a terminal patient and the little girl would be left without family. And that's one of the things that really struck me and, and made me think this is a cruel, cruel life. But at the same time, I thought, thank God that this child was able to get into Fe y Alegría because she has the opportunity to learn, to get educated and subsequently go into society and get a job. And I think that is the primary role that really drives the core of the project. This is an institution that fights every day to help and not so much to differentiate, but they try to support the careers of super smart kids. Micaela, Damaris, they're all unbelievably intelligent people. The only thing is that they cannot express themselves through their voice. And that's the challenge. And so there is a clash of worlds, so to speak. And at some point, we act, also have to recognize the peacefulness of the team and the professionalism of the team members because they were still able to point the camera and do their jobs, notwithstanding the situation. I remember an interview that you did a few years ago and I remember it because it's like a movie that transcends the actual situation and it was about survival. And I don't know if you do the same thing as part of your work well, I haven't seen Life is Beautiful for a very long time, but I remember that my mother used to do certain things uh, to keep us at home when we were little. But the truth is, when we face reality, we have to face, in that particular case, the issue of concentration camps, a global Second World War. And yet he was creating a world for his son that was based on happiness and fun. He was trying to keep his son separated from the reality that everybody was living in that moment. And I've seen this in many places in the world. I've found the most beautiful smiles and, and I can tell you this firsthand in the Congo, one of the most dangerous places in the world, it's just south of Kivu. And I saw smiles that I had never seen before in my life. And so that's the beautiful thing about all this. You always have to smile in life because there's always a way to address it in the correct way. I think being predisposed to smile also helps change your mentality and it's also healthier. Yes, there was another journalist who used to say that people that see a war find themselves changed in a different way that regular people who haven't seen a war can't possibly understand. This was a war correspondent that also made possible for us to create bridges into a different reality. Do you think that when you're telling a story, I mean, in Santo Domingo, we're not talking about something as complex as other realities that you've documented. But do you think that a mere spectator like myself can really understand what you're trying to say or what you're trying to show? I think that you can approach that sensation. I think that the role for this type of documentary is to communicate to the world a story that is warm, 
And it's also vital, and I can say this firsthand based on projects that I've been involved in. I remember having seen my first, uh, or having done my first movie, and I had a wonderful experience in Japan and another one in Argentina. And it was amazing to see how you can bring the spectator into what you're doing. And so this is a documentary that can be seen not just in Ecuador, but in different parts of the world. You can have the audience wherever they are, see this and feel empathetic towards those children. So we are merely the conduits and perhaps the speakers and conveyors of these stories. And we tr need to try to interfere in the least way possible to tell the real story. I mean, my standpoint is that I want to shoot this story because I want to bring about a certain attention to it, though others could do the same thing. But there is sometimes a paradigmatic uh, relationship when we tell stories. You, there's a terrible situation but then you try to look at it from a different standpoint. Well, Carlos, thank you so much for taking the time to discuss this documentary with us. Clearly, there, it involves a great deal of work, many hours, and it's clear that you've put your heart and soul into us. It's kind of like the same attitude that we have here at the bank. This is not just a job, it's really a mission that we all have, and we want to thank you for all of your support. Well, I want to thank you for the wonderful work that you do and for giving life to these types of initiatives. Thank you very much. Big hug to you. Thank you to everyone else for joining us. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Pablo. I also want to thank Pablo for having made this film, for bringing it into our lives and into our homes, these stories of people that happen in other parts of the world that can help us see and understand the reality that is experienced by many other people. And by merely seeing this as spectators, we can enrich our own lives and perhaps be motivated, motivated to do more. Now we're about to launch the documentary, but before we do, I'd like to have a conversation with four fascinating experts to discuss this puzzle of trying to put these projects together, inclusion projects to try to struggle for improving the development of different countries across different subject areas. It's the type of work that requires different experiences and knowledge from different areas. And to give you an idea, we have four experts joining us today, Mercedes Mateo Diaz, Chief of the Education Division. We have Tomas Bermudez, the manager of the Andean Country Group for the IDB, Jaime Sarmiento, project manager for Fe y Alegría Ecuador, and Gonzalo Rivas, Division Chief of the Competitiveness, Technology, and Innovation Division. And we are with them here today, and I'd like to pose a question to each one give you two to three minutes max for you to answer. I'm gonna be very strict with the time, not because what you have to say is any less important, but rather because uh, we want to get to this unbelievable story. Mercedes, I wanna to go to you. Thank you for joining us. I wanted to ask you the following. At the IDB, in the educational area, you're starting to address the challenges for education with uh, the so-called disruptive models and these tend to address abilities or skills that are classified as 21. And these are meant to be the necessary skills that citizens need to have for the 21st century. And I wanted to ask you if you could discuss some of these essential skills that the 2021 or the 21st century citizen needs to have. How are you supporting the creation of these skills? How are you doing the capacity building to create these uh, fairer societies. Thank you very much, Federica. And uh, after having heard a conversation, such an interesting conversation between Carlos and Pablo, I would like to start by a basic aspect, but um, important to this conversation. The capacity to communicate language is fundamental for the human being, even for dreaming, as the title of the documentary indicates. 
and so in education it is a skill that we call a foundational skill because the development of other skills depends on that and this is key in terms of what the bank does working together with Fi and alegria supporting children with disabilities in ecuador all the benefits that we see that relate to the learning of language i don't want to uh, talk about the documentary right now which we will see briefly in, in a few moments um but the uh, the story of Damaris and the triangle created between the school, the mother and Damaris herself, all around the topic of conversation. There is another aspect that we have mentioned and relates to the development of skills. How can we uh, do this in children where nothing is expected of them uh, by the society? So I would like to turn this um, question around how do we educate others how do we educate others that um can then put value in the difference find the value in the difference and we have see this from uh, the point of view of the need to change educational system it's not the perspective exclusively of the child who has a disability how do we maximize the child's potential is what we are seeking to achieve people with difficulties hearing difficulties are underrepresented represented in many careers in science technology engineering mathematics we know that within uh, the digitalized social context, it's key to have people um, with these abilities and we need to provide the talent um, in, in addition to the specific technical capacities, we have to um, develop these uh, skills that are, make one different from others. In a polarized society, these occupations that have a better salary are those that combine both aspects, critical thinking, the ability to resolve problems, creativity, leadership, and specialized technical skills. And that is where we want to be uh, as a region. So uh, in a situation where we can innovate and prosper in a global world. So these tools are key. We need to um, develop them in everybody. There is experimental evidence that shows that supporting first year students that have hearing disability in a STEM uh, program significantly improved their ability to resolve problems. And these effects lasted in throughout time. So they incorporated a learning uh, based on experience. So the children with hearing disabilities were given the opportunity to resolve problems facing a real life scenario. They had to learn in, uh, for example, a nuclear engineering lab. So this type of experience is what needs to be included in the educational structure so that these young people have the tools to then contribute effectively to the well-being of our countries and the prosperity of our countries. That is the change that needs to occur. Thank you, Mercedes. Very interesting and very pertinent to this conversation today. I would now like to... Um, invite Jaime, the director of the project from Fe and Alegría in Ecuador. Jaime has been working on this project since 2009 when it started, and he has seen this enormous transformation. He has been a witness to this development of these children throughout these 11 years. So Jaime, thank you very much for all your contributions, for being such an incredible partner in this field and for the working on this project. Could you please tell us a little about how you have seen the opportunities for these children change and the work that you have undertaken with the community? So 
you who have been a witness of these changes, could you please address um, this topic? Because what you have seen since 2009, the changes that have occurred in the community, if you could tell us a little about how the community itself has changed throughout these years. Uh, thank you, thank you, and greetings to everyone who is with me on this panel and the uh, public in general. So thank you. Uh, this project that is uh, shown here in this documentary not only addresses the education of deaf children, but there are other aspects that were not included in the documentary. So I wanted to point out three specific aspects to understand better the context from where we started and the changes that have occurred in the community. First, the educational community. When a child that he can hear, he can, and he starts his schooling, he can communicate his needs, he can talk to the professor. Um, but when our project started, uh, this didn't happen with these uh, children because the school was waiting for the children to arrive. Um, they had a diagnosis or they were diagnosed rather late in their lives as well, five or seven years old, and they started their educational later, six, eight or 10 years old. And so the first change was uh, regarding that situation when the school starts go out uh, seeking out these children and trying to identify these children with these special needs earlier. The often the members of the family do not know a sign language, so the children are living rather isolated within their families. So this has very serious repercussions in terms of the development of the child. So language is a foundational skill for any uh, child. So we need to identify and help this child uh, sooner than what was happening uh, in the community. So when we provided uh, sign language instruction to the family, the early stages of the family of uh, these children, um, well, uh, allowed them to learn at an earlier age. Um, the expectations of the education of these children was broadened immensely through this project. We obtained resources from the Ministry of Education to hire uh, sign language interpreters that work together with deaf students so that they can go on to their high school. And this created a lot of change in Santo Domingo, and it was a situation that created trust and complicity, one could say, amongst the people involved, the members of the community, the families became involved in this effort. And we were able to then create this interest and move towards efforts for these children to have um, secondary education. All this was done thanks to uh, the family's involvement. And third, the third aspect I wanted to cover was the quality of the education. When we started, we had no awareness of best practices. There were different educational models that were being used, but we established a national bilingual model and this for Ecuador and that we have, this is part of the importance of the development of these long-term projects. Today, the educational center where these children continue are following up on their education, they are of 
have a national level recognition. They have uh, the support of IBM now to uh, start a project called PyTech. Um, so there are many innovative projects uh, that generate opportunities for these um, students. So with that, I invite you to watch the documentary and you can uh, learn about the life history of these children. And I just wanted to finish by thanking Carlos and all the members of the technology and innovation team for the uh, support that was given to the project, as well as the uh, Japanese fund and Financec and others who have shared with us this belief that we can dream in sign language. So thank you very much. Thank you for your um, contribution throughout these years. Now, Gonzalo Rivas, the head of the Competitiveness Technology and Innovation Division. Gonzalo, good afternoon. I would like to ask you the following question. This project was born and was developed uh, by a division that is in charge of uh, topics of innovation and technology. This might not, so, seems to be counterintuitive. Could you please tell us a little more about the potential of innovation and technology to resolve these social problems? Thank you. Greetings to everyone. Uh, uh, this is something that has been of interest to this division. As an example, hydrocephaly uh, was thought to not have any solution until uh, this um, was the case of a child of a hydraulic engineer's child, and he was able to develop t um, solutions from his professional skills. So uh, when we use our money, we are indicating where bus businesses or enterprises should innovate. And so what occurs with those who do not have the ability to have their voice heard both in an organized group or in the marketplace. When we started this uh, social innovation effort, we found that we were being proposed solutions looking for problems, basically. So at that point, a person approached us, a person a, a person called Sara Gotinga, she uh, said, well, what are the problems of those people who cannot be heard? That was a very important lesson for us because that was telling us that through different platforms, we could start to listen to those people who didn't have a voice. And we were able to realized that with our resources and with what we had, we were able to help these people. So this National Council of Innovation in Chile, we wanted to undertake a project in the south of Chile in an area called Coriaico. So we sent emissaries, one could say, that could speak to people without them realizing that they were talking to public officials to try to detect which were the main problems in the area. And what we discovered was uh, that the main problem was the disheartenment and the lack of hope amongst the youth. There was a high incidence of suicide but and other problems. So we had been invested in infrastructure, roads, etc., and we realized that that didn't make any sense. So we 
needed to address the real problems in the region. It wasn't an infrastructure problem necessarily. So this has to do with what we are addressing here. We do not have adequate processes to listen to find out what the real problems of the people are. I will talk about two other lessons we learned. These projects generated important technological innovations, but also of great importance was that this is not only a technological problem, it has to be accompanied by uh, sociological and psychological issues. For example, the uh, approach or the attitude of uh, parents in this case regarding their children is of extreme importance. So here, we have developed software that has been used throughout the world, but there is no venture capital that is um, willing to um, fund this uh, software. But here in Ecuador, there is a software that has 7,000 users in 35 uh, uh, countries, but uh, there, was, there would be many more people who could use this software, but there is no venture capital that is willing to invest in this. And that is one of the big challenges that we are facing today. So, Tomas, Tomas Bermudez, who is the manager of the Andean region at the IDB. Thank you very much for being with us today. The question I wanted to ask you, you as the manager of this region, you have a broad vision of all the challenges to inclusion in the area. Gonzalo has just mentioned the importance of technology when dealing with these challenges, but what can we do for this to have an impact on inclusion? Thank you, Federica, and thank you very much for your invitation. Um, this is an excellent documentary. We will see it shortly, but the topic of inclusion is extremely difficult. It is complex because it means that we need to bring sources from different disciplines and from different institutions. And this is difficult to do, especially in a context such as Santo Domingo or similar contexts where we often work in the region. To achieve a real inclusion, we don't only need technology, we need medical support, psychological support, the labor market and the community needs to understand the limitations that are being faced. And if we don't achieve all of that, it's very difficult to achieve a real, a complete inclusion. So this is, as I mentioned, extremely difficult. So yesterday, talking to Carlos, he told me that on with some of the studies that they're undertaking related to this project, he mentioned that hearing disabled uh, people learn, earn less than others. Uh, and it has, relates to the, their access to education. The access to education, in order to achieve that, we don't only need technology, we need credit and laws as well, but we need to also create a multidisciplinary approach that is required to achieve true inclusion. This is the um, focus that we had when we developed this project in the bank. And we, as a bank, can address these topics of inclusion. We have many disciplines that we can have access to that would allow us to address these topics. So technology is important, but as the document shows, when we uh, have, uh, uh, see these group, this group of young he hearing disabled uh, students, we see the challenges they need to face and inclusion 
it also involves the community. The children have to be able to communicate adequately with their parents and the rest of the community. So as mentioned, I mentioned talking to Carlos yesterday, as a result of this project, the amount of students that are thinking of continuing their studies and obtaining a university uh, career uh, has increased significantly as a result of this project. These children are very enthusiastic. They have a vision. They have the skills and the capacity, although they are facing a difficult situation, but their dreams are achievable and we are obtaining uh, the results that we have been seeking to obtain throughout the, through this project. So lives are being changed as a result of this project. I wanted to congratulate Pablo uh, for this excellent documentary and uh, the, the awareness that he's created regarding this problem and the solutions. Well, we will now start the documentary. I will uh, now just ask you to spend the next 21 minutes, which is the, length, the duration of the documentary. It's to, we will gain a better understanding of the lives of these children in Santo Domingo in Ecuador. We will get to know Victor, Micaela, Damaris, and they will surely inspire us to continue helping and undertaking more projects of this nature. Thank you. We will start the documentary. Alegría is enormous. It's really wonderful to be here. It is an association for people who are where in an area where the asphalt ends, where the roads come to an end. As our director used to say. I am very happy to be here. It has helped me a lot. To tell you the truth, I can speak to my colleagues, my professors. They have taught me the alphabet, words, signs. I'm very happy to be here. It has been great to be able to study, to learn, and that is very important. Thank you. There is no other specialized institution in Santo Domingo, if no organization or nobody is in charge of uh, this sector of this, this group, this group of people, Fe and Alegria will do so. Uh, these children often have had no possibility of accessing an education or they start their education later than others. I have lived here all the time I have lived here. It has been a great experience for me. The smile that I have had while I play, the patience that uh, has been shown to me because we were taught, we learned here sign language. My mother learned sign language, the professors also. Everything that we have done uh, has been done with tranquility, with patience, and we have been able to learn with our families. We have been able to play, to learn, to uh, with my family. It is very important to learn sign languages. We have all learned both hearing people and deaf people. We have learned sign languages here, sign language here.
uh, every person with a hearing disability that approaches us is taken in by us we have we accept everyone we offer this uh, we have this bilingual community uh, here that accepts everyone that comes uh, that approaches us so here we can develop our intelligence our abilities we can go to the university in the future Victor. My name is Victor Herrera. I'm seven years old, and this is my sign. My name is Rosa. I have six children and the youngest is Victor Manuel. I discovered this when he was already sitting down. I would take him to, I took him to childcare. He said he, they told me he didn't speak, he couldn't hear. And the teachers there told me that they would call him to get a, a toy, but he wouldn't answer. And I would often tell him to say daddy, to say mommy, but he didn't answer so they told me there that he wasn't going to speak and he wasn't going to talk so i said okay um, my god i will receive him as his mother um he is my child so the emotional difficulties that the families are facing when they find out that the child cannot hear is very well, hard our children have um, been the cause of separations divorces they have also been the reason for families getting closer talking many of them approach us without knowing what to do they think of the things that the child does not have but i think we should look at it from another point of view the opposite or a the child is a human being with all his abilities. I never gave up. I continued working. I would cook and do the housework, and I had to uh, make do on my own. Sometimes I didn't have enough for medication. It was a little difficult at times. Victor finds himself in his environment, what has led to educate him where he lives, and he's a good boy. Victor can add, subtract, he's very active, he's always involved. In Sometimes you have to control him. And education begins with love and patience. And so we try to bring as much love and patience as we can. As long as we can keep him happy, then we're good. God allows me to have a life and I want to support my children as much as I can. There are so many things that we leave, need to leave them. We need to leave them with, with tools to face life, things, not material things, but autonomy, self-confidence, education. 
for all the arguments uh, against trying to provide education for disabled kids, you have to equip them with all the skills and tools that they'll need to face the world with autonomy, with self-assurance, and with a decisiveness that will be key. Hello, my name is Damaris Luna, and this is my story. I'm 16 years old. I myself took her to another doctor who said, yes, your daughter is deaf. She'll, she can't hear anything now. She never will. So I asked when she grows up, how is she going to communicate? She's going to be rejected. She won't be loved. And these are things that one thinks about. And I cried all afternoon. I locked myself in a room with her and I just hugged her and I couldn't deal with it. I cried and cried because for me, this was very painful that I would never hear her voice and that she would never hear me. Again, let me see. What was it? Help. Okay. Help. You're missing the R right here. A Y U D A R. Look. Yes, you're right, mom. I was confused. Ella por medio del internet. Through the internet, she looks for things and she just isn't looking for someone to chat with, but she's looking for information. She tells me, look, I've found other deaf people and she searches and she finds out what they're talking about. Then there's videos too. So that kind of opened the door and she's always attentive, looking, reviewing what materials out there that can help her. Any technological revolution invariably leads to a social revolution given that these technologies allow us to foster greater inclusion with persons who are disabled, we've brought about a social revolution in this community because we've gone away from the regular classroom with a blackboard and chairs and desks, but now with a computer, with technology, it's easier for us to garner their attention, to improve their learning. Damaris is a girl who likes to prepare herself. She's always looking on how to best prepare herself and she's always dreaming. I expect her to have a very prosperous, very successful future. I've been progressing little by little, but I want to finish school. Then in the future, my dreams become bigger and bigger. I have goals like attending university, studying, depending on whether it's psychology or perhaps I could be a doctor. I'm looking to see what I'm going to like in the future and also in which country I can do whatever I want to do. It could be in Chile or in other countries. I have many expectations for my future. Thank you. I started with you, remember? Yes, there were many difficulties at the beginning. The studying process was very slow. We didn't have uh, as much time as we needed in the beginning. We needed a profession that will make us feel good, intelligent, and happy. And this can be replicated in everything. And I think that's very important and it makes me feel good. I'm really happy that your mom has helped you so much like mine did. I think that family is very important. Yes, yes. Micaela.
las nenas como son gemelas empezamos girls, a ver since they're twins we started to see the difference in their development in each one and we were able to realize that Micaela had something but we didn't know what it was and so we had to get her tested and go to medical tests we traveled to Guayaquil to have her looked at to see what was happening and that's when they gave us the news that the sheep suffered from severe deafness in both ears so in basic terms she was deaf and it was a very big shock to us understanding the situation and condition of your daughter and begin the process of accepting which is the most complicated part of this for us since we're twins and many times people confuse us because we look so much alike we communicate through sign language and some people tend to look at us but this is something that's normal for us since we're attending the same school the second grade of middle school we get the same classes and so one of us can maybe progress a little faster than the other one and help the other one or vice versa my daughter was really helped by fe y alegría and she found other kids that had the same condition and this was very helpful for her she was able to express herself play and communicate with her classmates and we started to see this at a very early age and she was always very interested in learning more and in studying more and we were very delighted about that so these different uh, elements are very different and we need to add the coefficients with Micaela I feel very comfortable working with her because most of the responses that we garnered from the diagnostic in the test that she was the student that had the highest score and we've had children leave the school and they've been very capable more than capable of attending any university as long as these institutions have the necessary interpreters available to ensure that the instructors can share their knowledge and through the use of interpreters that knowledge can reach those students the main contribution that Fe y Alegría provides is to create a response for a human collective that didn't really have a response from the state available to it. There was no school that took on that responsibility, and so Fe y Alegría took it on. And that's what's really laudable about this situation. In fact, we provide consulting services so that the Ministry of Education could come up with their first draft program, and then they came up with the bilingual, bicultural educational model, the first of its type in Ecuador. This is a program that allows us to see these people as people who are recognized, or people that are recognized. And this sought to break down the stigma that people who couldn't communicate so easily or in the more established way were in fact people that have a great deal of capability. So this bicultural bilingual model is something that we know that works in the US and Spain and Japan. And now we know that Colombia, Chile, Argentina, Mexico adopted it and it works. And so this bicultural bilingual model has led to contributing the largest number of deaf persons attending college all over the world and that's a fact my name is juan carlos castillo this is my sign i'm 23 years old i work as a linguistic model at fe y alegría I teach sign language to the deaf community. Juan Carlos Castillo, the linguistic model who works for the institution, he is a living example of how 
he has been progressing towards high school after that to college, which he's still studying. But additionally, he has learned sign language on his own and he is now teaching sign language to others. This is a, the epitome of a success story. He's a deaf person that works with hearing people in a world of both hearing and deaf people. The role that he has for the institution is key, especially in the early years, because the person that teach the, teaches them sign language is the model, because we can teach him this, but it's different when it's someone like them that's training them. I can give them an hour of class and the children don't understand me completely. And then Juan Carlos shows up, he provides support, he gives them his version of the knowledge and the kids can then expand their knowledge base. Now we haven't yet learned all of the signs and there are signs that I can't come up with when I'm teaching a class, I might forget a sign and Juan Carlos is always there to support me at all times to ensure that the kids can learn in the best possible way. And so this has proven to be extremely effective, this joint work that we do as a team. I started here like them. And I understand this feeling of community. In this place, we have a feeling of love and warmth that transforms into our normality. Learning words is something that helps this. I love doing it. It's important that they see and dream about different professions and pathways. It's important that they want to go to school and that they don't feel discriminated against. My message that everybody needs to stick with education. This community needs to set the example so that they can see that th this can truly be done. It doesn't matter that you're deaf. It doesn't matter that you're deaf to be able to develop into a professional. You can open your own pathways as you see fit. The greatest dream is that every school and every university in the country can have a project that is great like this one and that everybody can benefit from it so that everybody can have the same potential and the same opportunities to achieve success in life, which is the dream of every human being. The more openness we see from universities and schools at the national level, the better this will be. That's the dream of Fe y Alegría. Thank you very much. I'm on camera already. Yes. Uh, well, again, thank you very much. Uh, the documentary, every time I see it, leaves me uh, speechless uh, in the best of the senses. Thank you so much to everyone who is here with us today that took the time to learn about these stories and understand this project a lot better. Thank you very much for the four protagonists of the documentary. Victor, Micaela, Juan Carlos, and Damaris, which hopefully are with us here today. Thank you for telling us your stories, telling us about the challenges you have had to face and your dreams to have a 
life full of opportunities and happiness. Thank you. Uh, uh, special thanks to Fe y Alegría in Ecuador, who have undertaken a wonderful um, project. Thank you very much to the uh, Japanese fund, to the Italian fund, who also provided support. Thank you so much to the speakers who were with us here today, who talked to us about that enormous challenge that we are facing and that we are trying to address as best possible. We will continue to work. We will continue to develop this type of project to ensure that nobody is left behind and that everybody can have a better life and a path full of opportunities ahead. Thank you again to everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Please. Be, take care. Thank you.